Welcome to episode 189 of the Bandhive Podcast. It is time for another episode of the Bandhive Podcast. My name is James Cross, and I help independent artists tour smart. This week on the show, I have a very special guest, Brendan Fry of the band Hostel Array. How's it going today, Brendan? Going well. Thanks for having me on. Glad to hear that. Super stoked you're here. We're here to talk about the waterfall method and how artists can use that to promote their music because it's becoming more and more common, but a lot of artists still don't quite seem to grasp it. So I want to dig in on this. But before we do that, this episode, we're recording in June, but it comes out July 11th. So if you have not yet done so, head on down to your local 7-Eleven. They're not paying for this. This is just me saying, go to 7-Eleven and get your free Slurpee. That said... <laughs> <laughs> Brandon, can you tell us a little bit about the background of uh, Hostel Array, please? Yeah, so most of us have been in local bands and regional bands for several years. All kind of got together in 2017 to start a new project. Most of us had already played in bands together at one point or another. Most of us had been in another band that had, you know, found some moderate success in the Christian metal core scene, but never really took off too much after kind of just changing direction stylistically and honestly just overall beliefs and values, kind of decided to reassess and start a new project with most of the lineup. Had a few changeovers at some points, but put our first album out in 2018 and have just been putting out new stuff ever since. Nice. Yeah. So that was a self-titled record. You've dropped several singles since then. And just a couple months ago, you dropped a new EP called Trauma. So that's the one we're going to talk about primarily today because that's where you've been using the waterfall method. But before we jump into that also, I want to talk about something you said before we hit record which was that you gained more traction online after the pandemic hit. And you even had two singles that were recorded entirely remotely during the pandemic. That's kind of what everyone did. But at the same time, most people didn't do it at the quality level that you achieved, which I think is really impressive. So let's dig in on that. How did you harness that traction? Like people don't just show up out of nowhere in the music world. You had to do something to get there. So what do you attribute that to? What do you think it was that you did that brought those people in and you got that attention from? I think it was a, a combination of things, really. There's a lot of things that go into getting your name out there that isn't quite as exciting as, you know, going out and touring and being on the road and everything. I would say a lot of times new artists, especially, kind of get really distracted by, I need to get out there. I need to play all these shows. I need to constantly, you know, just be grinding on the road to actually make any kind of name for yourself and music. But I kind of think of it as like the old MySpace days mentality, right? Because back when MySpace was a big thing, right, that was the way to get your name out there. And there was a surplus of people that would come to shows even for the smallest band no one ever heard of, right? Nowadays, you know, I, I just feel like people don't have the same time, the same money, the same resources to get out there and just check out local shows or smaller regional shows or even just, you know, upcoming touring bands they're a little bit more selective about what they put their time into. I don't think they're nearly as selective when it comes to what they check out on the internet, though. If you can grab someone's attention in that first five, ten seconds of exposure and, you know, they, they start digging into it, then I think that's where you can actually start to grow. If you're familiar with Bill Murray, Johnny Frank, who used to be in Attack Attack, you know, he did a video that kind of stuck with me a while back where he said, hey, if you're a new artist, don't focus on touring, don't focus on this, like, just build your brand online and see if there's anyone out there to actually take you up on what you're putting out. And that mentality just kind of stuck with us. And, you know, we kind of got forced into adopting that mentality over COVID, right? Because there weren't local shows, there weren't big shows, there weren't any shows happening. You stuck inside and kind of had to rethink how are we getting our music out there because the whole industry came to a halt in that sense. And surprisingly, you know, there was plenty of people online waiting to be entertained, right? Because they're stuck in their houses. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, perfect timing. Right, exactly. So uh, honestly, it was just a combination of trying to find the right placements out there, you know, between marketing via ads, you know, Instagram and things like that. Don't ever underestimate how effective putting an ad on someone's Instagram story can actually be. And interacting with independent playlist curators, and I'm not talking about people that are asking for X amount of money to put you on a playlist. I'm talking about people that actually care, you know, the 300 follower playlist or something like that, because they add up. But the more people you get your music in front of, the better. So it's really just like a snowball effect, right? Of, of who can I get this out to? Who can I contact and, and get their attention to actually listen to this? And it will add up over time if you're persistent enough. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to make very clear that 
there's also a very good reason to avoid those paid playlists, which is that Spotify, if they find out, they will remove your music. So for anyone listening, if you didn't know that, do not ever pay for playlist placements on Spotify. Spotify will potentially remove your music, but it also can just trash your algorithm. I've seen so many artists that you'll go into their fans may also like section on Spotify. And if that is completely missing, which some artists have that completely missing, they're probably botting their plays and it's not good. It reduces the availability for exposure on things like Release Radar, Discover Weekly, things like that, because, I mean, the algorithm does play into finding that passive listeners, right, that that could help kind of really expose you to new people. So don't pay for things like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just not a good idea. And you have a great example of how you can make things work without paying for playlist placement. Obviously, what you did worked for you between the social media ads, the organic playlist promotions. Did you use like Submit Hub or Groover or anything like that? Submit Hub, daily playlist, things like that. You know, they a lot of people kind of discount how effective they can be because in a vacuum, they're not super effective, right? Getting one or two placements on there isn't really going to do a lot. And also getting placements on playlists that don't make sense. So like if you're just sending your stuff out to, you know, indie alt-rock playlist at, you know, whatever playlist curators list of playlists, it probably won't be any good for you if it doesn't actually fit the genre or the audience you're trying to find. So like smart submissions on Submit Hub and daily playlists and things like that are great for growth, I think, you know, because it, it not only does it get you, you know, new people to actually listen to you, but it also kind of helps the association for the algorithm as well. So definitely use those. Definitely also, you know, find people that just have their Instagram handle or Gmail account <laughs> listed in their Spotify playlist, you know. If they try to charge me or something like that, I'm like, no, you're probably not legitimate. I'm going to back off of this. But you'd be surprised how many people are actually like, hey, I really like this song. I'm going to add this to my playlist. And anyone that listens to it, you know, hopefully they discover you as well. You really don't know until you ask, right? So that's it's persistence and dealing with a lot of people not responding to you. But also for every couple that actually do get back to you, you might actually gain some traction. Yeah, definitely. And it's also, you know, a numbers game. The more people you reach out to, the more people you're going to reach. Maybe you reached out to 100 people. You have five or 10 new people. That's great. You reach out to 1,000 and you can split this with your bandmates. You each take 200. Guess what? Now you have 50 to 100 new people who are into your music. Well, you know, it, it's funny because I feel like a lot of times when we're talking about the internet, it's like the bar moves so substantially for like what is considered actual value, right? Because like if you had 100 people show up to a show, and actually pay attention and listen to your music, you'd probably be stoked on that, right? So why is it any less impactful when 100 people willingly actually check out your stuff? Now I'm talking real people, not bluff numbers that someone might have fabricated. If you have 100 plus people that are actively listening to your music online, that's 100 real people behind that. I think that a lot of people seem to forget that when you see artist numbers that are, that are huge and you start doing a comparison, it's like, no, be grateful that anyone's actually checking it out. And, you know, hopefully you can keep building that fan base to stay persistent. Yeah, absolutely. And same thing, like if you have people uh, posting photos of your merch, this happened to us a couple of weeks ago. A friend of mine posted a picture wearing our shirt. My guitarist reposted. I'm like that. Yes, do that. Maybe <laughs> next time drop in a link to the merch store. But yes, anytime we get anything like that, repost it. Even if it's just one person, because one, that's going to make them feel good about their decision to post them wearing the shirt. But two, it's going to remind people that we have merch. And, you know, every band is desperate for social media content. If somebody tags you, that's free content. Just repost it. If it's something bad, don't share it. You know, if they have a Confederate flag in the background or something, like, don't share that. You don't want to put that out there and have that associated with you or your music. Right. You, don't, you definitely don't want to make those negative associations by yeah. any means. Oh, <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah. So we're here to talk about the waterfall method. And I'm not an expert on this either, but from my understanding, it's you release a single. Then a month or two later, you release another single, and the first single is the second track on that release. And then you do that until you have like three or four songs. And that is like the absolute dumbed down version of it. Can you take us onto a deeper dive into that journey? Tell us about the specific way you handle it for the Trauma EP and what inspired you to go this route for this EP. So... I know that one of the biggest ways that we got more attention on our music was by keeping people's attention spans by, you know, actually releasing content over a period of time instead of all at once. In in 2018, when we dropped our first full album, we had, you know, 10 songs on there. And for the most part, I'm still 
pretty proud of what we put on there, but it was just some tracks just got way more listeners and kept way more listeners over time. And I realized it's because we didn't really get people exposed to all the tracks that were on the album. It felt like this investment we made financially into recording, the marketing, the music videos, all those things that went into really setting that up was kind of like a lost investment to some extent. You know, I'm, I'm still happy that those things are out there, but it just didn't get the full return on investment that we were looking for. And so then we started playing around with the single market and noticed that every time we released a single, just by and far, even if the songs were not as good as a song we might have put on the album, you know, that's all subjective. But even if it wasn't necessarily by our standards as good, it still got more plays, not only at the time of release, but after the fact as well. And so thinking about that in the context of an EP, we're like, well, why not just apply this same method? Because I feel like a lot of times when people are discovering music, they don't have that attention span, right, to go through five albums. I know if I'm, you know, looking for new music on a given Friday or something like that, I'm going to check out like Release Radar or Discover Weekly or something that Spotify's put together for me, right, to see what is new out there. Do I like this song? And, and, and most people, I feel like the casual listener doesn't really dig into albums like they used to, right? So with that in mind, we were able to kind of transition and think, okay, well, why not take all these songs that are of a similar theme, a similar sound, similar mix and master, and just repackage them and kind of almost double dip on the exposure aspect there, right? Because when you put out new music on Spotify or Apple Music or anything, you know, people that are already following you are going to get that notification, right? The saying, hey, this artist put out new music. So if you can continuously do that and keep bringing them back, whether or not you package that every single time a new song comes out and add them together or do it all as one big release, kind of like we did, it brought additional listeners back that may have just casually checked this out at that time. And then they remember that and say, hey, I liked this when this came out. Why don't I add this to my playlist? Why don't I add this to my personal library, etc.? So really, it's just kind of like that consistent exposure to actually get a long-term fan. For us with the Trauma EP, we actually kind of released parts of it over a course of a whole year. It wasn't necessarily originally intended to be that long of a duration, but just production delays and everything kind of happened that were a little out of our control. But at the end of the day, it, it still worked out. We ended up doubling down on a little bit of a PR campaign at the end, partnering with Tyler, that, you know, kind of got us together to begin with here. He was able to help us, you know, pitch that to a lot of different publications to kind of look at it in the full picture of all these songs together, even though some of these songs had already been out for almost a full year. I think that's a really good note is that you're still talking about the songs from a year ago. You're not just focusing on the latest song. Because a lot of artists, they drop the song and that's the last you ever hear of it. It's like, hey, we have a new song silence, crickets, nothing. So the waterfall method, you know, of course, it allows you to refresh people's memories of that song by having as the second song behind the next single or whatever. But also just you're making the point of you still talk about it. Tyler has been talking about the package as a whole rather than, hey, this is the new single. It's on the EP coming out. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, hey, this is the new single. We also have these other songs. I think that's really important too, is it's not just you put it out there and forget it exists. Right. I'm seeing a lot of pop artists, a lot of hip hop artists doing this exact same thing where they'll take these songs and you don't see this as much in the rock community, which I think is kind of a, a weird cultural thing with rock music where it's like we are scared to do self-promotion. I don't know why. I don't know where that comes from in our culture. That it's, I don't know if it's not DIY enough to self-promote, which sounds silly, right? But it's almost like it's uncool to do that. It's like, no, you should be hyping your stuff out. And then there's inappropriate ways and appropriate ways to do that. Don't be that guy that's just in every random person's DMs after, you know, add them on Facebook or Instagram. Don't don't be that guy. You know, there's but there are people that are genuinely looking for new music, right? There are people that are seeking and that's the audience you need to look for. It might be an old song to you, but if you're still an upcoming artist that not many people know of, it's going to be a new song to somebody. There's nothing wrong with keeping the hype and promotion around something that just because they, it didn't pick up traction immediately doesn't mean that it's not going to pick up traction two months, three months, four months, a whole year after the fact. Especially now that we have things like TikTok, for example, you know, where the most crazy trend can blow up a song that might be a year, two years, hell, 10 years old even. You know, you, you see all kinds of crazy stuff happening. So if you have something that you've put time and energy into, stand by it and don't be afraid to, you know, double down on on promoting it to, to a new audience because you never know who's listening and who might actually 
dig what you're doing. Absolutely agreed. And I think probably some of that difference might come down to mental health. And I'll be the first to say, I don't know how mental health in the hip hop community is, but in the rock scene, there's a lot of people who have anxiety or just incredibly shy. And I think that's probably part of it. I can't say for sure, but just from knowing the people that I know in the music scene, I'm just like, they're afraid to post because it's like, hey, what if this stranger doesn't like my music? With a small handful of rappers I've worked with over the years, it's kind of like, they just don't care. They just do it. If anything, their ego is too big. And they're just like, I'm the best. I'm like, dude, you're playing to five people. Do your set, but don't have this huge ego. You know, like I, I definitely see that difference. And maybe that's tying into the promotional efforts as well. Like they're not afraid of what people think. They just go do it. I think there's definitely a way to find balance, right? I think you definitely need to be able to find a place where you're confident in your music and everything. But at the same time, you don't want to come off as, you know, arrogant or anything yeah. about about your relevance or, or anything, you know, because there's a certain level of humility that I think is still important to keep intact. But as far as the mental health aspect goes, like I, I totally can relate to that because there are days, there are times, there are weeks where I just don't feel it. You know, you start overthinking everything. You start wondering, like, yeah, does anyone actually care about this? It's like, yeah, I can I can check and see how many people are actually giving us the time of day, how many active listeners are actually like checking out what we're doing. But it, there's still this self-comparison aspect, right? That's like, well, I'm not doing enough or I could be doing more and maybe I should be doing this differently. Or, you know, then you start really getting into the spiral of like, well, the imposter syndrome, the, you know, uh, the anxiety about actually getting people to listen to what you're doing or whether or not it even matters. Whew, yeah, it's a whole bag that you have to kind of undo and not just for, you know, music promotion, it's just life in general, right? So it's just another area that it affects. Definitely no stranger to that here. So it's one of those easier said than done things for sure. Yeah, I think that's one of the keys is that if people don't recognize the struggle that they're having, you were exactly saying imposter syndrome, that's a huge one. And honestly, if there's somebody who doesn't face imposter syndrome, please tell me how. Like, <laughs> but I think recognizing that is the first thing, because once you know, then you can say when it happens, oh, that's this thing. You know what? I'm just going to stand up and power on. This is going to suck, but I'm going to do it. And ultimately, you see people who are posting all the time. And at the larger levels, maybe they have a social media person bugging them, like in the DMs on Facebook or Slack or whatever, being like, yo, post this, post this. No, I said post this. Just do it. Like, post it. It's good. We don't all have that. But what we do have, at least in the rock world, typically, is bandmates. So maybe if you need somebody to remind you, be like, hey, we're all going to make a post today. Let's go do this. Last one to post has to buy lunch at the next practice. Trying to stay consistent on social media and the pressure that puts on artists is, is something that truly kind of sucks it's one of those things where it's we have the accessibility that we've never had before right where we can directly interact with potential fans or existing fans but then there's that constant pressure of having a certain persona or pumping out enough content that truly is a real drag right especially when you're getting into this predominantly to share your art and it's like well it starts to overshadow what you're trying to do with music it starts becoming, it's like, are you a content creator first or a musician first or an artist first? And I don't even know if I've quite figured that out, honestly. I, I definitely try to lean more towards the artist side because I don't have the mental stamina to be a, uh, you know, a one-man show of content creation by any means. Just not in my personality. And hopefully there are people out there to still appreciate what we do without having to constantly be posting on TikTok or Instagram or whatever platform you prefer. So... It's a struggle. And if I ever figure it out, I'll be sure to let you guys know. <laughs> yeah, please do. Well, and so on that note, let's talk a little bit about the social media promotion that Hostel Array does. Let's start with the basics. How do you figure out what you're going to post when? Do you make a schedule first and then fill it with content? Or do you make content first and then just post it when you can? I have gone back and forth and tried multiple methods for this. And, and honestly, I, I don't think anyone can truly say there is one exact format that's going to work for everyone. You need to kind of figure out what your brand is, what your user, listener, or fan base is going to be receptive to. I've done the create 20-some assets and then schedule promotions and everything or schedule the post. That's one thing that I've definitely done before. I've also done the, okay, I'm going to do this at random as, you know, the content idea comes in. 
I would definitely say the one I feel most comfortable with is having the assets ready and kind of a rough plan of this is when I'm going to schedule this post. This is when I'm going to put this out there. Just because I know for me who likes to have a plan and just work it all out, it works better for me. But not everyone's like that, right? Some people just like doing things at random as they think of the ideas, as they think of the concepts. And, it, and maybe it is a little bit more organic, but not everyone's the same. As far as just purely promotional aspects, though, we've actually kind of leaned in a little bit to automation aspects as well, as far as like promoted ads. As a band, we kind of set aside, you know, a little bit of money every month and just continuously run Instagram ads using the similar asset that we've had for a couple months or so, usually taking video clips that we've made or something like that and kind of editing it down to like a short 15 minute or sorry, 15 second. God, 15 minute ad would be terrible. <laughs> oh, 15 second ad. The stuff of nightmares. <laughs> and you can't skip it. No, <laughs> no, we'll edit it down to like a 15 second ad, you know, and it usually redirects people to either, you know, our Spotify or Apple Music or, or whatever we're trying to promote at that time. And you'd be surprised how much passive growth that could do for you. We just let it run for like five bucks a day. And sure, we could have a larger budget if we had more expendable income to throw at it. But even $5 a day really does continue to bring new people in that are mindlessly scrolling through Instagram one night or going through Instagram stories and say, oh, hey, that sounds kind of cool. What's this? Let me check this out. And you just never know if it might land in front of. So I definitely would encourage finding automation tools. Like we use a platform called Tone Dead that makes it really, really easy. There are also people out there that can do ad consulting if you're not super familiar with things like the Facebook or Instagram ad managers. I definitely recommend not just running like a boosted post because those can be very lacking in the return. But yeah, I think tools like Tone Den or similar tools are great for trying to find that audience, you know, be self-aware of who you think your music's going to land well with. Target that and let that automation kind of do some of the heavy lifting for you. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And especially the thing about boosting. I love calling people out for that. I'm just like, you're going to get so much better return on ad spend by doing literally anything else. But yeah, so when you're talking about Tone Den and the automation, I've used meta ads directly. Does Tone Den interface with that so you can set the ads up in Tone Den? Or what's the benefit of that tool? It basically sets it up as a more user-friendly GUI on top of the Facebook Ad Manager's platform, right? The Facebook Ad Manager's platform is not user-friendly. It is very much set up for actual corporations that have a large marketing spend that can, you know, actually do it on their own, right? Not five dudes in a band that are trying to figure out how they're going to afford Taco Bell at the end of the run, right? That's not, yeah. <laughs> that's not who this was designed for. Tone Den, on the other hand, is actually designed with user-friendly aspects in mind, especially some of the things they have, uh, specific playbooks, things for like YouTube growth, things for Spotify growth, all kinds of little things like that that are curated for artists of different levels. And you can really start running something like that with something as easy as $5 a day, like I said, if you just want to kind of test it out and see how it works. If you're expecting to have a blow up overnight or something like that, using it for like a week or so, that's not really the vibe that you're going to get from it. You know, it's more so a slow growth kind of thing. I know that from the time we started running ads and really leveraging its capacity, it, just on Spotify alone, we went from probably about 500 followers to over 3,000 followers in about, you know, a year or so, which is, you know, still not a huge follower base, but that's significant growth nonetheless. And those are people that you get to retain as you start releasing new music, things like Release Radar, things like Discover Weekly, all those kind of things factor into that Spotify algorithm. So the higher your follower count, the better. Definitely. With Spotify, it's not like other social media platforms where your followers might not even see your stuff. Spotify, because of Release Radar, you're probably going to be on there. If you put something out and they follow you, Spotify is going to do their best to put you in there. Or even if not that, like you'll get a notification. I get notifications on my phone saying like, hey, this person released a new album or a new song today. It's like, okay, cool. I'll go check it out. That's much more reliable in my experience than, hey, we made 20 posts on Instagram and somebody saw two of them. Exactly. You got to kind of think of it from the user mentality, right? So like, how is that person going to interact with this platform? If you see something, a post that someone made on Instagram that says, hey, there's a link in our bio, everyone does it, right? Everyone has to do that to some extent. 
to, you know, really, really pull in the people that are truly trying to seek out your stuff. But most people, you know, if you if you have 100 people viewed at, how many people realistically are actually going to click that link, go through multiple hops until they get to your streaming platform or whatever, directing people directly to what you're trying to get them to, whether it be Spotify, YouTube, Apple Music, wherever you want to see growth is so important because if you get someone doing more than two clicks, I'd be surprised. Most people don't want to do more than that. They want to do one click and be done with it. I know I'm not too far off of that. If you could make me search for something and I don't know who you are or why I'm doing it, probably not going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so you really kind of have to get into the, the psychology aspect of like, well, what is going to make this person click this? What is going to make this person actually pay attention and, well, give a shit about what we're doing? Yeah, it has to be as easy as humanly possible. The thing that always gets me, to be honest, is Spotify pre-save campaigns on Instagram. You click it, and then you have to sign in on the Instagram browser. It's like, I'm not doing that. I've signed in a billion times, and I'm just like, I'm not doing it. If you can't get that link right, where it's like, hey, open this in Safari. Here's the link to do that. Now click this. Great. Then I'll, I'll do it. But if you can't get that right, I'm not doing it. Right. I'm still not convinced that pre-save campaigns really do anything. I think it's one of those things that the idea sounds great, you know, because mm -hmm. you, you get someone that's like pre-saving and, you know, it's going to automatically add it to their library and everything. But it's a good idea in theory, but I have not seen anyone that has come by and said, you know what, pre-saving really just put our release over the top. No, it's it's usually after it's already out and people are checking it out. That's when it really matters, in my opinion. Right, when people can hear it and decide if they actually like it or not. Exactly. Yeah. So we've discussed social media. We've discussed ads, which are part of social media, but it's different from organic. Does Hostel Ray use an email list as well? That is one thing that we have not leveraged nearly as much as I think we should. We've tried to implement that before in the past. It didn't quite get where I want it to be. And I have gone back and forth on the importance of it so many times. I know so many people say email lists are so important, and I don't disagree with them. It's just trying to actually stay consistent on capturing that data is definitely a challenge within itself. I know there's a bunch of automated platforms out there, and it's all my list of things that I, I want to still play around with and see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, okay. Because I'm a big fan of email, and it does take more work, but I find that even if you only have like 50 or 100 people on there, those are 50 or 100 people who are really invested versus, you know, you might have two, 3,000 on social media and they're passive. They might not even see stuff. Email, they're going to see it in their inbox. Whether they open it or not is a totally different story, but they're going to see it. They might be one of those people with like 13,000 unread emails. <laughs> I would be having a meltdown if that happened to me. I have like 100 and I Notification freak out. Notification anxiety, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the people who don't even turn off the notification badges, that's like... I got shamed by someone at a liquor store one day trying to use Apple Pay because they saw my notifications that I hadn't checked. And <laughs> I was like, I'm really just getting shamed by the girl at the liquor store right now <laughs> for having notifications on my phone. I'm like, well, I'm going to go back and clear all my notifications now. <laughs> <laughs> She's probably thinking of the person who like left her on red or something. <laughs> it was like, oh, that kind of guy. <laughs> I, I was not expecting it, man. I was not expecting it. <laughs> Oh, uh, life lessons from the uh, clerk at the store. <laughs> oh, anyway, moving on to a, another subject. It's clear that you're not afraid to invest in your music between the production and the ads. Being in a band isn't cheap, but you're also still a DIY band. How do you kind of combine those aspects? Because a lot of people would say, if you pay for anything, you're not DIY, which is I think is ridiculous. You can be DIY and still have people who help you with things and you pay them. That's totally fine. You're still DIY. Being DIY is more about, hey, we're doing this ourselves. We're not on a major label. We don't have management. That's how I view it. So how, how do you combine these things and kind of toe the line so people aren't yelling at you? Well, honestly, at this point, I mean, you're never going to make anyone 100% happy, right? There's, there's so many weird and subjective opinions around how you should carry yourself as a artist and how you navigate the business aspect of it. I don't know anyone that has made it anywhere without investing at least some time or money to get additional help on something. To me, being DIY means, you know, you still have control and you still have ownership of what you're doing, right? Most of your favorite artists that are, you know, on a label or something like that, they probably don't own everything about their brand, if anything. And at that point, they're kind of more of an employee to the label or the brand. So I, I would say we are definitely 
still fully DIY despite the fact that we outsource a lot of the stuff we do. It's like, where, where do you draw the line? Do you draw the line that you have to make all your videos on your own? Do you have to self-engineer everything? It's like, no, everyone is relying on someone to do something, right? The place that I think that is important is, are you actualizing your creative vision? Are you actualizing the goals that you want to maintain and are you doing it on your terms? That's kind of what makes something truly DIY to me. And, you know, if, if you don't want to be a DIY artist or don't want to be involved in DIY, I'm not going to shame anyone for that either. You know, everyone should have the right to do what they want to do with their art or their careers or whatever that may be. For us, you know, we're all people that have our own careers. You know, I work full time as a uh, government IT worker, right? And a few of us are actually in tech in the band and some of us have photography gigs and some of us are just office workers as well. We do what we do in life and take that and fund our passion projects. Because at the end of the day, you know, like, yeah, I would love to see music actually pay the bills, right? But the reality is that's a very small percentage of people that get to take their art and pay their bills with their art. Everyone else outside of that that doesn't get to do that, it's passion projects, at least until something might turn over. So uh, I think there's just some reality that people need to check when they're talking about what is actually going into making this stuff happen. Yeah, I fully agree with that. I mean, I think it's the kind of thing where artists like your band or probably my band, we're at a similar outlook of, I love to say, DIYs decide it yourself. My drummer came up with that. The people who would call us out or call you out are probably also the people who are like making tapes in their basement. And like the only thing that's DIY is like, you recorded this with one microphone in a basement. It's fully live. There's no edits. Like that's <laughs> DIY. It's like, no, that's not what it means at all. So I love what you're saying about, hey, you're in control. I think that's a really good way to put it because ultimately like you're working with Tyler, but he works for you. He's going to give you his advice but you're still in charge. It's a partnership at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great way to look at it. And yeah, anybody you hire is a partner on that project. So before we wrap this up, I just want to say, Brendan, thank you so much for being here. Everywhere, Hostel Ray, at Hostel Ray, HostelRay.com. You did well with the branding aspect. You're the same thing everywhere. <laughs> had to make sure we had that before we picked the name, you know? <laughs> had to make sure that no one else had it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, just imagine if you had to do like Hostel Array official, that would be just so long. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be a fan of that. <laughs> I'm calling out my bandmates who did Nerves official. <laughs> like, guys. <laughs> anyway, anything else that we should know about Hostel Array before I let you go for the day? Just make sure to follow us on things like Instagram and TikTok and, you know, I'd say Facebook, but I don't really know anyone that actually follows music on Facebook <laughs> half the time anymore. So Instagram is probably where we're most active and most responsive. So be sure to hit us up there and hopefully we'll keep working on uh, getting some more material out in the next year. Stellar. All right. Brennan, thank you so much. All those links will be in the show notes at bandhive.rocks slash 189. That's the number 189. As well as anything else we mentioned, brands, bands what have you. It'll be in there, stuff like Tone Den. Again, Brendan, thank you so much. Been a pleasure talking with you, and I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. Yeah, thank you.